All right, so if you're a Marine or if you know anybody who's a Marine, you probably have heard the quote, retreat, hell, we just got here. Now that quote was by Captain Lloyd Williams, who was a captain that served with the Marine Corps during World War I at the Battle of Bella Wood. You also probably know that quote if he served in 2-5 because that's like literally one of their slogans and everybody says retreat hell all the time in 2-5. 2-5 was one of the battalions that was at the Battle of Bella Wood because he had 5th Marines and 6th Marines that were both there. You probably also remember the quote or have heard of the quote, come on you sons of bitches, you want to live forever? Which was said by Gunnery Sergeant Dan Daly when he was fighting there at Bella Wood as well. Now, the term devil dog was earned by the Marines for the actions that they took at Bella Wood because the Germans thought they fought so fiercely that they fought like devils. And so they started calling them Tufelhundens or Tufelhunden. Tufel. Tufel Hunden. Anyway, that's where we earned the term devil dog and the rest is history. As far as the Marine Corps history is concerned, the Battle of Bella Wood is right up there with Way City, Fallujah, the Battle of Marja, the Battle of Chosen Reservoir, the Battle of Iwo Jima, Peleliu, Battle of Okinawa, places like that. It's right up there because it's one of the most historic battles that the Marine Corps fought in. There's tons of tales and legends. There's a couple of different Marines that fought there that would later on become the Commandant of the Marine Corps, but we'll get to that point later. All right, so the Battle of Bella Wood began on 6 June 1918 during World War I and lasted until 26 June 1918, so it was about 20 days long. Bella Wood is roughly five miles west of Chateau Thierry and about 55 miles northeast of Paris, France. To give you a better perspective of its relevance, Bella Wood was part of a much larger campaign where American forces were working with the French and British armies to halt the German Spring Offensive. The Germans had launched a massive attack along the Western Front in March after signing the Brest-Litovsk peace treaty with the Bolshevik government in Russia, allowing them to move units away from the Eastern Front to reinforce the Western Front. During that period of time, Russia was going through what's called the Bolshevik Revolution, which was basically a full-blown communist revolution. And so they were like, we, we can't handle this. We can't handle dealing with this war and also dealing with a full-on communist revolution in our country. So we're going to go ahead and like uh, take a step back. They pretty much stopped fighting for the most part in 1917, but they didn't sign this peace treaty until 1918, the next year after they kind of took a step back. It took the pressure off of the Germans so that they could then focus on the Western Front in France where they were fighting the, the rest of the Allied forces. So German leaders hoped that the influx of 50 divisions would overwhelm Allied forces in France, ending the war before millions of Americans could reinforce them. Initially, the Allied forces were successful because the German offensive was starting to wane by May during the Eisne offensive, leading American units like the 2nd Division and its 4th Marine Brigade to join the fight at Bella Wood, remaining engaged with the enemy throughout June. The combat at Bella Wood involved five German divisions against the U.S. Army's 2nd Division of the American Expeditionary Forces, which include the Army's 3rd Infantry Brigade and the 9,500 Marines and Sailors of the 4th Marine Brigade. Now, the 4th Marine Brigade consisted of two separate regiments, the 5th Marine Regiment under Colonel Wendell Neville and the 6th Marine Regiment under Colonel Albert Catlin. Each regiment consisted of three rifle battalions of 800 men each and also a machine gun company. Imagine an entire company that's dedicated to machine guns. That's pretty freaking cool. The operational area encompassed a forested high ground running roughly one mile north to south and between one quarter and one half mile east to west. To the west of the wood lay Hill 142, which at the time was under German control, while a wheat field was located roughly southeast of the wood. The village of Borsch was to the north past 800 meters of wheat. By June 4th, over 2,000 German soldiers with at least 30 machine guns occupied Bella Wood, and another 100 Germans with at least 6 machine guns held Borsch. Now, the wheat field had little to no cover whatsoever, so German machine gun fire from the wood could decimate anyone who attempted to cross the open terrain. And unfortunately, it was equally as treacherous to attempt maneuvering through the thick tree line where over 2,000 Germans were lying in wait. So needless to say, the Marines were stuck between a rock in a hard place. That's not a great position to be in because like the, the last thing you wanna do is try to make some sort of movement with a large amount of troops over an open 
wheat field for 800 meters where it's just like knee high wheat, but not really much micro terrain and nothing to provide cover for you. You're basically completely open to enfilade fires from machine gun positions that were in the town and also in the woods. D horrible, horrible idea to just cross that without some sort of support. During the early preparations for the battle, the 4th Marine Brigade established a defensive line southwest of the wheat field and Bellow Wood with the 5th Marine Regiment on the left and the 6th Marine Regiment on the right. Now, to give you an idea of what the situation looked like, at the time, the French were being routed left and right, and they were warning the Marines that they were going to be attacked imminently and that they should retreat, which is where the famous words of Captain Williams came from, where he said, retreat? Hell, we just got here. If you're in 2-5 or you got know anybody in 5th Marines, retreat hell. I knew a lot of guys that when they were with 5th Marines, when they would acknowledge you, like, say, Roger or understood, they'll say, retreat hell, and then they'll go about their day. And that means, yes, I understood what you meant. So it's still something that's being used. Anyway, the Marines held their ground, ultimately forcing the Germans to withdraw back to the relative safety of Bella Wood after they had attacked. And Burrish. 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 I don't know, I'm never going to get that right. Burrish. Burrish. After repelling the assault, the Marines began game planning how to conduct an attack on Bella Wood and Brish. The initial plan was to assault the enemy positions without significant focused artillery support in the hopes that the expert marksmanship training they received would provide them with an edge over the Germans. This still didn't take into account the fact that in order to reach the objectives, they would need to traverse over 800 meters of open, knee-high wheat fields with little to no cover or concealment to speak of. Now, yes, the Marines did have quality marksmanship training, and yes, they were lethal. However, they were warned by the French not to attack without heavy artillery support shaping the battle space first. Now, the French have been fighting the Germans for four years in trench warfare, like back and forth, going back and forth. They understood the dangers of attacking without machine gun support. They understood the, the, the dangers of attacking without artillery support because they had been doing it for four years prior. And... In that time, they had learned some extremely painful lessons. Like, they, they lost a ton of people. Like, assaulting straight into machine gun nests without any type of artillery support. Like, that would just get you completely wiped out. You would lose whole squads or entire platoons in a matter of seconds. They were trying to, to warn us so that way we would, or at least we could potentially avoid having to learn some of the painful lessons that they learned earlier in the war. Despite the warnings from the French, the Marines decided that their marksmanship abilities would be enough to locate, close with, and destroy the enemy. Which if you don't know, the mission of the Marine Corps Rifle Squad is to locate, close with, and destroy the enemy by fire and maneuver, or to repel the enemy assault by fire and close combat. I just put that in there because I know that it'll tickle someone's jimmies. At 0345 on June 6, 1st Battalion 5th Marines attacked and drove the Germans from Hill 142. Unfortunately, they suffered around 400 casualties as a result of not using artillery bombardment to soften the enemy positions or in coordination with the attack. And they did this because they were hoping that they could kind of be more stealthy because they were like, oh, we don't want to let them know that we're attacking. And obviously at this point in the war, people knew that if there was a big artillery bombardment coming, that they were likely going to be attacked. And so the Americans were like, let's attack them with like light artillery and not go heavy on it because we don't want them to know that they're being attacked. As a result of that, like they were not, we didn't really shape the battlefield. So we, we took a lot of casualties. The Germans launched a few counterattacks in an attempt to retake the hill, but they were repelled. One Marine was even awarded the Medal of Honor for actions that he took repelling one of these assaults. His name was Gunnery Sergeant Ernest A. Jansen. Now, Gunnery Sergeant Jansen's citation reads as follows. Attention orders. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty in action with the enemy near Chateau Thierry, France, 6 June 1918. Immediately after the company to which Gunnery Sergeant Jansen belonged had reached its objective on Hill 142, several hostile counterattacks were launched against the line before the new position had been consolidated. Gunnery Sergeant Jansen was attempting to organize a position on the north slope of the hill when he saw 12 of the enemy, armed with five light machine guns crawling towards his group. Given the alarm, he rushed the hostile detachment, bayoneted the two leaders, and forced the others to flee, abandoning their guns. His quick 
quick action, initiative, and courage drove the enemy from the position from which they could have swept the hill with machine gun fire and forced the withdrawal of our troops. Sounds like a freaking badass. The dude charged into 12 enemies, bayoneting two of them, and was just so fierce and vicious, he scared the rest of them off and they dropped their machine guns and turned tail and ran. What a hard dude. People were just, people were just freaking hard back then. Hard as nails. There's eight rocks. They just ate freaking rocks. Just, um, 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 um. you know what I'm saying? Like dudes were just built different. I mean, these guys were like, they grew up in the 1800s. You know, they were just growing up in a tough, they were just hard people, man. It's crazy. That same afternoon, Brigadier General Harbord, who is the 4th Brigade commanding officer, ordered an attack to seize Bella Wood. This attack was going to take place in two different phases. The first phase of this attack was intended to take the town of Bresh. 2nd Battalion, 6 Marines took charge of this attack, though they suffered about 50% casualties in the process of taking it due to the fact that they attacked over the 800 meters of open wheat field with no support from anyone on their flanks. Despite being pinned down and suffering casualties, the surviving Marines pushed into Bresh, engaging in house-to-house -house combat and expelling the German 7th and 8th Companies 398th German Regiment who were defending the town. One of the officers, a Lieutenant Clifford Bledsoe Cates, took a machine gun round to the helmet. Bing! Kind of like that scene from Band of Brothers, you know, when they're in that town, that dude gets hit in his little, in his dome piece. I don't know yet. <laughs> Knocks him straight on his ass. Anyway, he took a machine gun round to the helmet, which rendered him unconscious. Eventually, he came to and continued into Bresh with the remaining men that were left. That same man would eventually become the 19th Commandant of the Marine Corps. On June 8th, Major Thomas Holcomb, the commanding officer for 2-6, wrote to his wife praising his men's performance despite the heavy price they paid. He said to his wife, quote, The regiment has carried itself with undying glory, but the price was heavy. My battalion did wonderfully. There was never anything finer than their advance across a place literally swept with machine gun fire. There was never such self-sacrifice, courage, and spirit shown. Obviously, there was a lot of hard lessons that were learned from this, but the Marines did everything they could to, to fulfill the mission, despite the fact that they took heavy casualties. That evening, another American attack began with 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, and 3rd Battalion, 6th Marines striking the center and southern sides of Bella Wood. However, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines suffered heavy casualties from German machine gun and artillery fire while advancing over the open wheat field. It was later reported that most of the battalion was killed or wounded. Most of the battalion was killed or wounded out of 800 people. Most everyone was either killed or wounded. That's insane. Like, like that's like a 90% casualty rate or something. 3rd Battalion, 6 Marines made it to the southern edge of the woods, but they were stopped dead in their tracks due to intense enemy fire. Amid the chaos, Gunnery Sergeant Dan Daly famously rallied his men with, Come on, you sons of bitches. Do you want to live forever? Despite their efforts, the Marine couldn't manage to press further in, and only a handful of them ever made it into the woods. At around 1730, the 6th Marine Regimental Commander, Colonel Alpertus W. Catlin, was shot in the chest, which left him paralyzed temporarily on the entire right side of his body. After that, he was replaced by Lieutenant Colonel Harry Lee after he was evacuated from the battlefield. In total, there were 1,087 Marine casualties that day. Six officers and 222 enlisted men were killed in action, while another 25 officers and 834 enlisted men were wounded. Bro, that is that is unreal. Like, today's standard, that's like an entire battalion reinforced were casualties. That's crazy. That is in one day. That's like if the entire battalion attacked something and like everyone became wounded or killed. That's insane. Six officers and 222 enlisted men were killed. That is unbelievable. What a demoralizing thing to have happen. That's that's not just like, okay, you see the numbers, right? But everybody else that's alive, like you, I can't, I don't know how you wouldn't be demoralized from taking that level of casualties. There were more casualties that day than the entire history of the Marine Corps up till that point. So like every single battle leading up to that battle right there in that day, the Marine Corps hadn't taken that many casualties in its entire history combined, which is, that is, un that is just unbelievable.
The level of casualties were likely as a result of the lack of artillery support and the fact that Brigadier General Harbord seriously underestimated the enemy's strength and capabilities. The evening of June 6, Brigadier General Harbord ordered a halt to all attacks. Now, they tried to maneuver on June 7th and June 8th, but it was communicated that it was a completely wasted effort without heavy artillery bombardment. If they didn't have some sort of like some serious support, any other attacks would be futile. In my opinion, I think that Brigadier General Harbord learned from the mistakes of June 6 because he totally changed his approach when it came for the when it came up to the assault that they were planning for on the 10th of June. On the morning of 9 June, Brigadier General Harbord had ordered that over 28,075 millimeter shells and 6,155 shells be fired onto the German positions in Bella Wood in order to shape the battlefield and support the Marines attacking the following morning. Simultaneously, Brigadier General Harbord had ordered that 12 machine guns be emplaced in Bresh in a way that would allow them to provide suppression along the entire eastern flank of the woods. The, art the artillery bombardment continued the entire evening. At 0430 on 10 June, the Marines began their final assault to take Bella Wood. Once they had passed into the tree line, the fighting became grueling for both sides. Artillery was causing trees to explode all over the place, sending shrapnel in all directions, and the Germans sent high volumes of shells and mustard gas into the woods as well, resulting in over 150 people needing to be evacuated due to gas exposure. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was commonplace with knives, rifle butts, bayonets, and trench shovels, and really anything anyone could get their hands on to use as a weapon of opportunity at that point. But speaking of gas, speaking of mustard gas, this was the first time it had really been employed. And in the earlier parts of World War I, gas wasn't really widely used as much. According to the 2008 American Journal of Public Health, in July 1917, where the loss of their technological superiority and perhaps their ability to win the war, the Germans deployed a new and more troublesome chemical agent, mustard gas. Although mustard gas was introduced late in the war, it became known as the king of battle gases because it eventually caused more chemical casualties than all the other agents combined, including chlorine, phosgene, and cyanogen chloride. Harry L. Gilk Christ, who was the medical director of the gas service, the U.S. Army Expeditionary Forces, described the first mustard gas casualties as, at first, the troops didn't notice the gas and were not uncomfortable, but in the course of an hour or so, there was marked inflammation of their eyes. They vomited, and there was a rhythma of the skin. Later, there was severe blistering of the skin, especially where the uniform had been contaminated. And by the time the gas cases reached the casualty clearing station, the men were virtually blind and had to be led about, each man holding on to the man in front with an orderly in the lead. Now, unlike the lung irritants, chlorine and phosgene, mustard gas was a vesicant, similar to lewisite, that produced large blisters on any area of contact. Particularly severe blisters emerged when uniforms got soaked in mustard gas. If gas exposure was high enough, mustard gas could cause permanent eye damage, but this was infrequent. The complexity of treatment required in mustard injuries involved a new level of aid and medical care. Caring for mustard victims differed from caring for chlorine or phosgene casualties. Once evacuated, chlorine and phosgene victims received oxygen and bed rest until they were healthy enough to return to the front. However, soldiers exposed to mustard gas, especially in high concentrations or for periods that were long, they needed to bathe with hot soap and water to remove the chemical from their skin. If it was not scrubbed off within 30 minutes of exposure, blistering occurred. Portable shower units with specially trained medics helped minimize its blistering effect. These consisted of a bath truck provided with a hot water boiler and a number of fold down shower heads. After the troops showered, the chemical corps issued them new uniforms in exchange for their contaminated clothing. These discarded clothes were then decontaminated and reissued to other exposed soldiers. Because mustard gas induced eye injuries, casualties had their eyes washed as quickly as possible to minimize the duration of acute conjunctivitis, which generally lasted several weeks. Soldiers' care became increasingly difficult in the last year of the war with the increased frequency of gas attacks. Although mustard gas damaged the lungs more severely than either chlorine or phosgene did, these lesions were much more difficult to treat. The recuperation time for mustard gas exposure, which was about 46 days, was similar to that of phosgene. But mustard gas was a particular problem for both sides because after it was released, it settled into the area, which would contaminate the entire area, especially like low-lying ground. The vesicant often recontaminated soldiers and horses 
in contaminated unquarantined areas. A British soldier named Cecil Withers remembered being exposed to mustard gas during a mortar attack. He said, I suffered badly from phlegm and from coughs and colds a lot. That all started when the British were shelling at the last battle of the Somme. One of the shells disturbed the residue of mustard gas that had been lying there for months. They talked about secondary smoking. I got secondary gas. Dude, mustard, dude, chemical warfare is nasty. And we are very fortunate that we're not dealing with that stuff as much today because it's technically against the Geneva Convention. Dude, I can't even imagine Imagine, I can't imagine like, or fathom fighting a war where you're getting shot at by machine guns, you're getting shelled every day and you're getting gas, bro. Like count me out. That sounds awful. Because mustard gas was heavier than air or water, it settled in ditches or at the bottom of trenches and puddles and created persistent environmental hazard for troops, civilians, and animals alike. All a soldier needed to do was disturb the dirt, mud, or water, and he would suffer from gas exposure. Persistency was not a problem, not only on the battlefield, but also for the medical corps. Because of the volatility of mustard gas, a single gas soldier could contaminate medical personnel, the ambulance, and also other patients. The medical Corps created a special evacuation system to minimize this type of contamination once large quantities of mustard gas were used in combat. Although new to gas warfare, the United States moved quickly and used mustard gas offensively in June of 1918, when U.S. mustard gas production was 30 tons per day. 30 tons per day! Bro, we were making mustard gas too. I didn't realize that. Lewisite, which might have replaced mustard gas had the war continued into the winter of 1919, was a superior weapon that caused instantaneous blistering, was lethal in minute quantities, was relatively difficult to detect, and perhaps more importantly, had a molecular structure that allowed rapid dissipation. This last factor allowed attacking forces to move into enemy territory without fear of contamination and injury. The bloody toll of mustard gas by the war's end is indicative of its usefulness as an offensive weapon. Although approximately 30% of all war casualties were victims of gas exposure. More than 80% of the approximately 186,000 British chemical casualties were caused by mustard gas alone, with a death toll of approximately 2.6%. What a miserable way to go out. Freaking out, choking to death. You've got blisters forming all over you. You can't breathe. You're getting shot at by machine guns. You're getting shelled by artillery fire. Your friends are all dying around you. Like everything's dirty. Your feet are soaking wet. It's been raining. You're in a trench. The food's terrible. Bro, trench warfare, not fun. As we've seen in stuff that's going on over in Eastern Europe right now, bro, dudes were straight up not having a good time. This extremely large number of casualties among well-trained and equipped British troops indicates the destructiveness mustard caused on the battlefield. American Expeditionary Forces combat losses included more than 52,800 battlefield fatalities, with approximately 1,500 dying of gas-related injuries. Unfortunately, death and injury caused by chemical agents were not restricted to the battlefield. Bro, I wanted to give you guys an idea of like the seriousness of gas attacks. Back to the story. On 11 June, another individual took actions that would eventually result in them being awarded the Medal of Honor. This individual's name was Lieutenant Orlando H. Petty of the United States Navy, who was treating casualties throughout the entire time that he was on the battlefield. His aid station ended up getting blown up when it was being shelled. Now, when this happened, he personally carried another officer through an artillery barrage to safety. The officer that he carried was Captain Lloyd Williams, who was famously quoted saying, retreat hell, we just got here, small world. Lieutenant Orlando Petty's citation reads as follows. Attention orders. For extraordinary heroism while serving with the 5th Marine Regiment, United States Marines in France during the attack in the Bois de Bello, 11 June 1918. While under heavy fire of high explosive and gas shells in the town of Lucy, where his dressing station was located, Lieutenant Petty attended to and evacuated the wounded under the most trying conditions. Having been knocked to the ground by an exploding gas shell which tore his mask, Lieutenant Petty discarded the mask and courageously continued his work. His dressing station being hit and demolished, he personally helped carry Captain Williams wounded through shell fire to a place of safety. Now, Captain Williams survived, thanks to him, survived that day, but the following day, Captain Williams passed away from his wounds. 
On June 18th, the Army's 7th Infantry, who were relatively still inexperienced at this point, relieved the Marine battalions who were extremely fatigued from all the fighting they had been experiencing. So the 7th Infantry attempted to clear the rest of the wood by themselves, but suffered heavy casualties and were, were unable to do so. As a result, Brigadier General Harbord sent in 3rd Battalion 5th Marines to replace the 7th Infantry and ordered an artillery barrage on the remaining German positions. Now, 3rd Battalion 5th Marines suffered significant levels of casualties, but thank Thanks to the artillery bombardment, they were able to maintain some sort of momentum. And by 0700 on 26 June, the final objective in the northwest corner of the woods was taken. After three weeks, three weeks of fierce, vicious combat, a report from the commanding officer of the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, declared Bella Wood now U.S. Marine Corps entirely. After the battle, the French government renamed it Bois de la Brigade des Marines. The French government did that to honor the sacrifices and the struggles that the Marines gave there. There was a lot of suffering and a lot of bloodshed on that battlefield. The 4th Marine Brigade members were also awarded the French Croix de Guerre, which was a French military decoration that was created originally in 1915 to reward feats of bravery either by individuals or groups in the course of the war. Now, despite the fact that we won the Battle of Bella Wood, the 4th Marine Brigade had staggering levels of loss. Out of 9,500 men, over a thousand men were killed in action. 4,710 were wounded or missing, including 4,598 enlisted men and 112 officers. During three weeks of fighting, Holcomb's 2nd Battalion, 6 Marines suffered 764 casualties out of 900 Marines. A thousand were killed in action. Think of like an entire battalion being killed, like the whole battalion. So imagine if just like one six or two six or three six, they went out on a mew. And imagine the entire battalion died from one battle. That's unreal. It's so hard for us to wrap our heads around because nowadays like that level of casualties, like I don't think the American public could stomach that kind of stuff. And I don't think the Marine Corps could either at this point, but that's what happened. Like that's, that's un unbelievable. On June 6th alone, 2nd Battalion 6 Marines movement across the wheat field began with 500 Marines, and after taking Buresh, only 200 remained. In the earlier battles of World War I, it wasn't uncommon that, that units would suffer a 50 to 60% casualty rate, but that was before they had learned all the lessons about attacking machine gun nests head on with no artillery support and things like that. So like this was an extremely high casualty rate given that it was this late in the war and we could have learned all those lessons from the French if we had like asked them, hey, what were some of the things that you saw you know, in the earlier part of the war. In any case, Major Holcomb ended up surviving the rest of World War I, and he would eventually go on to become the 17th Commandant of the Marine Corps in December of 1936. He actually supervised the, the buildup of the Marine Corps up until World War II when we were building up and plussing up to, to prepare for the war in the Pacific. So, and he was, he was the Commandant during a lot of that time. In total, there were four Medals of Honor awarded from actions at Bella Wood. Gunnery Sergeant Ernest A. Jansen, who I was talking about when he bayoneted those two guys and caused the other folks to leave when they were trying to go take the hill. Gunnery Sergeant Fred W. Stockman, who was awarded it posthumously. Lieutenant Orlando Henderson H. Petty, Medical Corps, United States Navy Reserves. Lieutenant J.G. Whedon Osborne, United States Navy, posthumously awarded. There were also 143 Navy crosses that were awarded to various individuals as a result of actions they took at Bella Wood. And to give you an idea of how important a Navy cross is or like how heavy a weight that that carries, a Navy cross is only second to the Medal of Honor. And 143 of those were given out as a result of actions taken there. That's intense. You know, despite the heavy losses we took, the success at Bella Wood is cemented into our history. It's still discussed and researched heavily to this day. And it's a huge part of our folklore especially with so many legendary Marines that served there. And whether it was 2-5 maintaining the slogan, retreat hell, we just got here. Gunnery Sergeant Dan Daly said, when he said, come on, you sons of bitches, you want to live forever? By the way, Gunnery Sergeant Dan Daly was one of two Marines in the entire history of the Marine Corps to be awarded the Medal of Honor twice. So just a little side tidbit for you. Anyway, the Battle of Bellawood proved to the rest of the nation that Marines were not only soldiers of the sea, they were capable of operating in expeditionary operations in contested environments in a joint environment when they needed to work with other branches and also other nations. And they proved that we could do that 
during that battle. They also proved that they were able to navigate the complexities of war. We did we did have to learn some very painful lessons. After we learned those painful lessons, we got back up, we dusted ourselves off, we took the Marines to victory. Anyway, I know that was a very intense battle. This battle will remain extremely historically relevant and it will always be an extremely important battle to the Marine Corps. I hope that if you didn't know anything about this battle that you learned something today. I certainly have learned a lot from this. Let me know what you thought about this video in the comments. Let me know if there was any other tidbits of information that you think are is cool or if there's things that people might find interesting about this battle that I maybe didn't mention. Put it in the comments so we can share it with everybody else. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Until next time, goodbye.